Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of The Reading Corner with Moose Changer Pat and the epic Pawn of Prophecy by David Eddings. As always, please read the original at some point and buy the book because it's an incredible series. And now, Chapter 6, told by Moose Changer Pat. That's me, in case you're wondering. They had walked for miles. How many, Garion could not say. He nodded as he walked and sometimes stumbled over unseen stones on the dark road. More than anything now, he wanted to sleep. His eyes burned and his legs trembled on the verge of exhaustion. At the top of another hill, there always seemed to be another hill. For that part of Sendaria was folded like a rumpled cloth. Mr. Wolf stopped and looked about, his eyes searching the oppressive gloom. We turn aside from the road here, he announced. Is that wise? Dernick asked. There are woods hereabout, and I've heard that there may be robbers hiding there. Even if there aren't any robbers, aren't we likely to lose our way in the dark? He looked up at the murky sky, his plain face dimly seen troubled. I wish there was a moon. I don't think we need to be afraid of robbers, Wolf said confidently, and I'm just as happy that there isn't a moon. I don't think we're being followed yet, but it's just as well that no one happens to see us pass. Mergo Gold can buy most secrets. And with that, he led them into the fields that lay beside the road. For Garion, the fields were impossible. If he had stumbled now and then on the road, the unseen furrows, holes, and clumps in the rough ground seemed to catch at his feet like every step. At the end of the mile, when they reached the black edge of the wood, he was almost ready to weep with exhaustion. How can we find our way in there, he demanded, peering into the utter darkness of the woods. There's a woodcutter's track not far to the side, Wolf said, pointing. We only have a little farther to go. And he set off again, following the edge of the dark woods, with Garin and the others stumbling along behind him. Here we are, he said finally, stopping to allow them to catch up. It's going to be very dark in there, and the track isn't safe. I'll go first, and the rest of you follow me. I'll be right behind you, Garion, Dernick said. Don't worry, everything will be all right. There was a note in the Sniff's voice, however, that hinted that his words were more to reassure himself than to calm the boy. It seemed warmer in the woods. The trees sheltered them from the gusty wind, but it was so dark that Garion could not understand how Wolf could possibly find his way. A dreadful suspicion grew in his mind that Wolf actually did not know where he was going and was merely floundering along blindly, trusting to luck. Stop, a rumbling voice suddenly, shockingly said discreetly ahead of them. Garion's eyes, accustomed slightly now to the gloom of the woods, saw a vague outline of something so huge that it could not possibly be a man. A giant! He screamed in a sudden panic. Then he became, because he was exhausted and because everything that had happened that evening had simply piled too much upon him all at the time, his nerve broke and he bolted into the trees. Garion! Aunt Paul's voice cried out after him. Come back! But panic had taken hold of him. He ran on, falling over roots and bushes, crashing into trees and tangling his legs in brambles. It seemed like some endless nightmare of blind flight. He ran full tilt into a low-hanging, unseen branch, and sparks flared before his eyes and the sudden blow to his forehead. He lay on the dark, damp earth, gasping and sobbing, trying to clear his head. And then there were hands on him, horrid, unseen hands. A thousand terrors flashed through his mind at once, and he struggled desperately, trying to draw his dagger. Oh no, rabbit! A voice said, none of that, my rabbit. His dagger was taken from him. Are you going to eat me? Garriott babbled, his voice breaking. His captor laughed. On your feet, rabbit, he said, and Garriott felt himself pulled up by a strong hand. His arm was taken in a firm grasp, and he was half-dragged through the woods. Somewhere ahead, 
There was a light, a winking fire among the trees, and it seemed that he was being taken that way. He knew that he must think, must devise some means of escape, but his mind, stunned by fright and exhaustion, refused to function. There were three wagons sitting in a rough half-circle around the fire. Dernick was there, and Wolf and Aunt Paul, and with them a man so huge that Garin's mind simply refused to accept the possibility that he was real. His tree-trunk-sized legs were wrapped in furs and cross-tied with leather thongs, and he wore a chain shirt that had reached to his knees, belted at the waist. From the belt hung a ponderous sword on one side and a short-handled axe on the other. His hair was in braids, and he had a vast, bristling red beard. As they came into the light, Garion was able to see the man who had captured him. He was a small man, scarcely taller than Garion himself, and his face was dominated by a long, pointed nose. His eyes were small and squinted, and his straight black hair was raggedly cut. The face was not the sort to inspire confidence, and the man's stained and patched tunic and short, wicked-looking sword did little to contradict the implications of the face. Here's our rabbit, the small weasel-like man announced as he pulled Garion into the circle of the firelight. And a merry chase he led me to. Aunt Paul was furious. Don't you ever do that again, she said sternly to Garion. Not so quick, Mistress Paul, Wolf said. It's better for him to run than to fight just yet. Until he's bigger, his feet are his best friends. Have we been captured by robbers? Garion asked in a quivering voice. Robbers? Wolf laughed. What a wild imagination you have, boy. These two are our friends. Friends? Garret asked doubtfully, looking suspiciously at the red-bearded giant and the weasel-faced man beside him. Are you sure? <laughs> the giant laughed then, too, his voice rumbling like an earthquake. The boy seems mistrustful, he boomed. Your face must have warned him, friend Silk. The smaller man looked sourly at his burly companion. This is Garion, Wolf said, pointing at the boy. You already know Mistress Paul. His voice seemed to stress Paul's name. And this is Dernick, a brave smith who's decided to accompany us. Mistress Paul, the smaller man said, laughing suddenly for no apparent reason. I am known so, Aunt Paul said pointedly. It shall be my pleasure to call you so then, great lady, the small man said with a mocking bow. Our large friend here is Beric, Wolf went on. He's useful to have around when there's trouble. As you can see, he's not a Sendar, but a Cherik from Val Alorn. Garion had never seen a Cherik before, and the fearful tales of their prowess in battle became suddenly quite believable in the presence of the towering Beric. And I, the small man said with one hand to his chest, am called Silk. Not much of a name, I'll admit, but it suits me, and I'm from Boxhor in Drasnia. I'm a juggler and an acrobat. And also a thief and a spy, Beric grumbled good-naturedly. We all have our faults, Silk admitted blandly, scratching at his scraggly whiskers. And I'm called Mr. Wolf in this particular time and place, the old man said. I'm rather fond of the name, since the boy there gave it to me. Mr. Wolf, Silk asked, and then he laughed again. What a merry name for you, old friend. I'm delighted that you find it so, old friend, Wolf said flatly. Mr. Wolf, it shall be then, Silk said. Come to the fire, friends. Warm yourselves, and I'll see to some food. Garion was still uncertain about the oddly matched pair. They obviously knew Aunt Paul and Mr. Wolf, and just as obviously by different names. The fact that Aunt Paul might not be whom he always thought she was was very distroubling. One of the foundation stones of his entire life had just disappeared. The food which Silk brought was a rough turnip stew with thick chunks of meat floating in it and crudely hacked off slabs of bread, but Garion, amazed at the size of his appetite, fell into it as if it had not he had not eaten for days. And then his stomach and his feet warmed by the crackling campfire, he sat on a log, half dozing. What now, old wolf? He heard Aunt Paul ask, what's the idea behind these clumsy wagons? A brilliant plan, Wolf said, even if I do say it myself. 
There are, as you know, wagons going every which way in Sandaria at this time of year. Harvests are moving from field to farm, from farm to village, and from village to town. Nothing is more unremarkable in Sandaria than wagons. They're so common that they're almost invisible. This is how we're going to travel. We're now honest freight haulers. We're what? Aunt Paul demanded. Wagoneers, Wolf said expansively. Hard-working transporters of goods of Sendaria, out to make our fortunes and seek adventure. Bitten by the desire to travel, incurably infected by the romance of the road. Have you any idea how long it takes to travel by wagon? Aunt Paul asked. Six to ten leagues a day, he told her. Slow, I'll grant you, but it's better to move slowly than to attract attention. She shook her head in disgust. Where first, Mr. Wolf? Silk asked. To Doreen, Wolf announced. If the one we're following went to the north, he'll have to pass through Doreen on his way to Boktor and beyond. And what exactly are we carrying to Doreen? Aunt Paul asked. Turnips, great lady, Silk said. Last morning, my large friend and I purchased three wagon loads of them in the village of Winald. Turnips? Aunt Paul asked in a tone that spoke volumes. Yes, great lady, turnips, Silk said solemnly. Are we ready then? Wolf asked. We are, the giant barracks said shortly, rising from his small... with his male shirt clinking. We should look the part, Wolf said carefully, eyeing Barrack up and down. Your armor, my friend, is not the sort of garb an honest wagoneer would wear. I think you should change it for stout wool. Barrack's face looked injured. I could wear a tunic over it, he suggested tentatively. You rattle, Sick Silk pointed out, and armor has a distinctive fragrance to it. From the downwind side, you smell like a rusty ironworks, Barrack. I feel undressed without a male shirt, Barrett complained. We must all make sacrifices, Silk said. Grumbling, Barrett went to one of the wagons, jerked out a bundle of clothes, and began to pull off his male shirt. His linen under tunic bore large reddish rust stains. I'll change tunics as well, Silk suggested. Your shirt smells as bad as the armor. Beric glowered at him. Anything else, he demanded. I hope for decency's sake you don't plan to strip me entirely. Silk laughed. Beric pulled off the tunic. His torso was enormous and covered with thick red hair. You look like a rug, Silk observed. I can't help that, Beric said. Winters are cold in Cherik and the hel hair helps me to stay warm. He put on a fresh tunic. It's just as cold in Drasnia, Silk said. Are you absolutely sure your grandmother didn't dally with a bear during one of those long winters? Someday your mouth is going to get you into a great deal of trouble, friend Silk, Barrack said ominously. Silk laughed again. I've been in trouble most of my life, friend Barrack. I wonder why, Barrack said ironically. I think... All this could be discussed later, Wolf said pointedly. I'd rather like to be away from here before the week's out, if I can. Of course, old friend, Silk said, jumping up. Beric and I can amuse each other later. Three teams of sturdy horses were picketed nearby, and they all helped to harness them to the wagons. I'll put out the fire, Silk said, and fetched two pails of water from a small brook that trickled nearby. The fire hissed when the water struck it, and great clouds of steam boiled up toward the low hanging tree limbs. We'll lead the horses to the edge of the wood, Wolf said. I'd rather not pick my teeth on a low branch. The horses seemed almost eager to start, and moved without urging along a narrow track through the dark woods. They stopped at the edge of the open fields, and Wolf looked around carefully to see if anyone was in sight. I don't see anybody, he said. Let's get moving. Ride with me, good smith, Beric said to Dernick. Conversation with an honest man is much preferable to a night spent enduring the insults of an over-clever Drasnian. 
As you wish, friend, Thurnix said politely. I'll lead, Silk said. I'm familiar with the back roads and upper lanes hereabout. I'll put us on the high road beyond Upper Grouts before noon. Barak and Dernick can bring up the rear. I'm sure that between them, they can discourage anyone who might feel like following us. All right, Wolf said, climbing up onto the seat of the middle wagon. He reached down his hand and helped up on Paul. Garion quickly climbed up onto the wagon bed behind them. A trifle nervous that someone might suggest that he ride with Silk, it was all very well for Mr. Wolf to say that the two they had just met were friends, but the fright he had suffered in the wood was still too fresh in his mind to make him quite comfortable with them. The sacks of musty-smelling turnips were lumpy, but Garion soon managed to push and shove a kind of half-reclining seat for himself among them just behind Aunt Paul and Mr. Wolf. He was sheltered from the wind, Aunt Paul was close, and his cloak spread over him kept him warm. He was altogether comfortable, and despite his excitement of the night's events, he soon drifted off into a half drowse. The dry voice in his mind suggested briefly that he was, had not behaved too well back in the wood, but it was, but it too fell silent, and Garion slept. It was the change of sound that woke him. The soft thud of the horse's hooves on the dirt road became a clatter as they came to the cobblestones of a small village. Sleeping in the last chill hours of the autumn night, Garion opened his eyes and looked sleepily at the tall, narrow houses with their tiny windows all dark. Adarag barked briefly, then retreated back to his warm place under some stairs. Garion wondered what village it might be and how many people slept under those steep peaked tile roofs, unaware of the passage of three wagons. The cobbled streets were very narrow and Garion could almost have reached out and touched the weathered stones of the houses as they passed. And then the nameless village was behind them and they were back on the road again. The soft sound of the horse's hooves lured him once more towards sleep. What if he hasn't passed through Doreen? Aunt Paul asked Mr. Wolf in a low voice. It occurred to Garion that in all the excitement he had ever actually found out exactly what it was they were seeking. He kept his eyes closed and listened. Don't start with what ifs, Wolf said irritably. If we sit around saying what if, we'll never do anything. I was merely asking, Aunt Paul said, if he hasn't gone through Doreen, we'll turn south to Morose. He may have joined a caravan there to take the Great North Road to Boktor. And if he hasn't gone through Morose, then we go on to Kamar. And then we'll see when we get to Kamar. His tone was final, as if he no longer wished to discuss the matter. Aunt Paul drew in a breath as if she were about to deliver some final retort, but apparently she decided against it and settled back instead on the wagon seat. To the east, ahead of them, the faint stain of dawn touched the lowering clouds, and they moved on through the tattered, windswept end of the long night in their search for something which, though he could not yet even identify it, was so important that Garion's entire life had been uprooted in a single day because of it.